Okay, folks, uh, we're back and we're talking about uh, international marketing. Specifically, uh, our class today is talking about uh, segmenting, targeting, and brand positioning. Or they're bringing them together. We're going to be going through showing uh, information about the theories about what the textbooks talk about a lot, and we're going to be talking again about the reality, hopefully with a application to the real world example of applying targeting and segmenting and brand positioning with a real life example similar to a Starbucks coffee franchise. So to start with, I will be going through the idea of identifying market segments and targets. Obviously it's very important. We have the whole idea of uh, in what ways can a company divide the market. You can sell to everybody, but you should try to focus on just the best customers possible. Some customers may actually be customers and buy things from you, but they may be bad customers, taking too much time, or uh, complaints and wanting refunds, or uh, giving maybe bad names, even though they're using your products, they may be saying there's a lot of bad things related to it to other people. So you may not want to have every customer, you might want to specialize. And traditionally, they followed Vilfredo Pareto's law, 80-20 rule, target the best 20% of possible customers because 80% of your benefits come from them. But increasingly, we're trying to focus on less than the 20%. On the 10% uh, or top 5%. If you can get those other customers, great, but focus on the best you can get. So how do you do that? What are the different levels of market segmentation? So there is effective targeting uh, requirements. Of course, you need to identify and profile all the different groups. Uh, find out different information about the buyers, how they differ in their needs, um, and the key word being their needs, and as I always talk about, you have to remember SRC, self-reliance criterion. What you think is normal is not as important as what the customer thinks is normal. So you have to identify their needs, their wants, their de desires, and as it says here, their preferences. Select one or more market segments to enter. You can do many. Last class, we talked about how you could work with just students, or you could sell coffee to the business person. How are you going to do that? It's best if you specialize and focus on these things. For example, we talked about how if we segment just the students, our brand image for older people, if we're connected with students, might be a certain image that older people are not attracted to. For example, if it's lower price for students, some of the older customers will walk away. One way to overcome that and keep those two different brand images and targeting those two different areas is to have the higher price for the upper class business person, but offer student discounts to get around it. And then you need to, uh, that is an example of how you can establish and communicate your distinctive benefits to the market offering. So what is a market segment? Market segment consists of a group of customers who share a similar set of needs and wants. Obviously, the consumer of coffee has similar needs. Some of them might just want to have a drink. More of them might want that caffeine to wake up. But then the needs can change. Like students might want just anything cheap to stay awake. Or other students might want something special like a brand name like Maxwell House, or they might want uh, the Starbucks, or as we saw last class, there's special Pol Posot uh, names of coffee shops in Korea that are just for the real connoisseurs of coffee. And some people will buy it just for that brand image. They will sometimes have that cup and keep it for like two days, three days, one week, and keep using it to show their friends. <laughs> Excuse me. So what is a market segment? Market segment consists of a group of customers who share a similar set of needs and wants. How can you target that? 
That's important because it impacts your marketing. Your marketing, the basics, many people say should not change. Some people say the basics, <coughs> excuse me, should stay the same for many, many months. Even though you could change your advertisement every minute or every hour, very easy with social media and YouTube. You should keep the same consistent image because some people say, because there's so much image around, people don't notice. What's the brand name of this projector? What's the brand name of this equipment? What's the brand name of your chairs that you're sitting in? We're at one of the best universities in the world. Do you guys realize, without looking, what type of chairs you're sitting on? Most of these chairs are some of the highest quality chairs you can get. Furzy, it usually says. You guys might have been studying here for many years, but most of you probably did not know these are Furzy brand chairs. So even though you're here, you're using it, you're sitting on it every day, you don't notice the brand. You don't notice the marketing. So it takes a long time to absorb that. If you change your marketing every day, it means you're going to lose the chance to attract people. So if you keep the message the same, the brand positioning, the image the same, target the same way, segment the same way, it's going to be more effective. You can change the color, you can change the shape, you can change some of the details, but the basic marketing message should stay the same. How you segment the consumer market? Here are some examples. Geographic, demographic, psychographic, behavioral. However you segment, the marketing message could and should be the same. What I call the kimchi factor or the impact factor. I'm not talking about the food kimchi and I'm not talking about the SSCI, Social Science Citation Index, impact factor. I'm talking about the marketing aspect. Whereas Korean people could be on the other side of the world and if they hear somebody say kimchi, they're going to turn around because that impacts them. Or if they smell the kimchi, they're going to turn around and look, where is it? Because that impacts them. You need to find what is that marketing that will attract and impact your customer like that. Impact factor or the kimchi factor. It could be a word. It could be a sound. It could be an image. It could be a smell. It could be many things. Whatever it is, each company must find what impacts the customer the best. So what would impact your best students if you're targeting students the most? What would impact them the most? Any ideas? Textbook prices? Textbook prices? Yes? What if you're selling coffee? For the coffee business, what is something that would impact the students the most? The logo. In Korea, not everywhere in the world, but the Korean student market might like to have that Starbucks logo. And if you're not working with Starbucks, you need to think, why do they want that logo? Does anybody care? What is the Starbucks logo? What is the Starbucks brand? What is the Starbucks logo? A girl with a star? Close. A goddess with a star? Close. Siren. What is a siren? I'm not talking, please, ooh, 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 I'm not talking about that. It is, it is a siren, actually. It's a... Yes. It's attracting, they say, sailors, but it's actually a combination of part fish and part girl. So if your girl friends are like that, cool, I want to meet some of those friends, but it's not definitely a regular girl. And there's something else, not just the fish girl, but something else. What else? It's green, yes. Is there anything that really attracts you to coffee? It looks cool. So here's the image here that we see. You see it looks like a girl. It has some sort of tiara or a crown, but she also has a fish at the back. Some people might not realize that she has that fish tail. Some people might think it's just waves or water or signs. But does it show anything related to coffee? No. no. So 
Is it a good image? If you're going to start a new business, it's all yours, it's new, it's your money, your investment, is this something that would be very valuable at promoting your business? Yes? You promote, you, you promote some sort of girl? Right? It, you're correct. What does this represent? Yes. So everybody knows this means what? It means Nike. What does Nike mean? God. It, God, victory. Most people don't even know that. They just know it represents shoes. But how do you know this? How do you know that equals coffee? People did the research. Did you do research to find this out? You told me. Somebody else told you because they're famous. More, more reality is these companies spent millions and millions of dollars to educate you. If you have millions of dollars that you want to educate people, go ahead. But if you're a small or medium-sized business starting, it's usually wise to Pick logos that can help inform the customer of what you are. Yes, you want to capture a position in their brain. Yes, you want it to be memorable. You want them to remember what you're doing. But most people, without the millions of dollars or billions of dollars of education from Nike, just know this is a check mark. Or it's an ax. This does not tell people you're selling coffee. It looks like it could be a fisherman's cup. Maybe they're planting something um, and it's a, a sample. So it might be a good idea when you're positioning yourself to think about those things. What type of image could attract most students well in Korea? What's a possible brand? We're going to talk about that today. So I want you guys to think about it at the end of today we will get together in groups and talk about it. But let's go on. Next, with your geographic segmentation, are you trying to promote luxury, sexy beaches? Are you trying to promote energy with your coffee? Are you trying to promote luxury with your coffee? To me, this is a sign of luxury. But does that match with promoting coffee? Maybe not. Also, when you're dividing the market, you have to think about the demographic segmentation. You have to segment what age of the customers, what lifestyle, what uh, gender, income, generation, social class, race, all the cultural backgrounds. Some people say, I, I think it's quite cute. Some people say, when you're a small baby, all you need is a little bit of milk. Give somebody milk and the small baby's happy. When you get older, you might like toys. When you get older, you might like friends. When you get older, you like lots of friends maybe partying in high school or in university. Maybe you start to like girlfriends and boyfriends. Then when you get a little bit older life stage, you might be more interested in trying to get some sort of jobs. Then when you get a little bit older, you're interested in getting married or having children. Then when you get older, then you start to like food. Some people make some of those jokes. It depends on who you are, but there are life stages to check. If you are looking for food just at that late lifestyle, should you be targeting them? The age and lifestyle stages. Are you interested in makeup always? Maybe not. Some of the young kids, when they're very young, just interested in the milk stage, might not care about makeup. As you get a lot older, are you still going to do this? So there are uh, life cycle stages that you can target. Gender and income. Sometimes the idea of income has a serious impact and the, the life cycle. For example, you could be selling toys. And children 
are the users of your toys. But you're not targeting them. You're looking at the, usually it might be the gender or the income, the income of the mothers specifically, not even the kids when you're marketing and branding your company for toys. And then of course, generational influences. Now you might be seeing a lot of standard and charters. They're starting to advertise in Korea a lot, trying to get the rich customers that they usually associate with being old customers that are finished work and just want to play with their grandkids. The standard and charter might be positioning themselves to be attractive to old, retired, rich people that want to give their money to young grandkids. And it's not just that. It's the idea of how do you give your money to your grandkids? The idea of you want to do it ethically. You want to do it responsibly. You don't want to just give them money to make them spoiled and bad people. You want to teach them the responsibility of it. So there's a lot that goes into it. And of course, race and culture. When we come to race and culture, a huge thing to be looking at is this stuff. You switch, you click on uh, Hofsted in any country in the world in Google, and you can open up a, another uh, website like this, and you can compare it to any country in the world. Oops, What's, oh, what just happened there? I just deleted Hofsted. Good, he's getting old anyway. Where are we here? Here it is. So uh, <laughs> uh, we have to watch our language for the video. Um, with the, I'm trying to link this back into, there we go. Which country would you like to compare? South Korea compared to which country? We're talking mostly about China, oh, sorry, mostly about uh, coffee. So we are in Korea. Where would you like to compare? Ethiopia? Let's see if he has information on Ethiopia. And we can do a third country. What is another country? United States, Canada, Europe, anywhere special? Any votes? Colombia. Colombia, OK. So here we have from Hofsted images of the culture of uh, Korea, which is the darker color, Ethiopia, which is the middle blue color, and Colombia. And we see that with respect to hierarchy, they're very close. With respect to individualism, they're very, very close. Most people in all three countries, Korea, Ethiopia, and Colombia, are all group oriented. We see a little bit different with their masculinity or career orientation. Um, Ethiopia and Colombia are slightly different, significantly different than Korea's view of masculinity. And with uncertainty avoidance, you see that Korea and Colombia are almost identical. These people, even though Colombians are very bold and, and full of energy and flamboyant, perhaps, we can see here that Colombian people also avoid taking risks. They will avoid things that are new to them, just like in Korea. So if you're a coffee business, you must seriously think about that. If you want to promote your business as being, we have the best Ethiopian coffee in the world. We have the best Colombian coffee in the world. When you go to Colombia, how you manage must be appropriate. If you try to tell people in Korea that you have business in Ethiopia and you have business in Colombia, Korean customers will think, wow, that's really good. He does real business there. He has the real original beans, the original coffee. Great. But if you go and you try to start a new business in Ethiopia, their uncertainty avoidance would be very different. The way that they work with you would be very, very different. How can you manage that with your branding, with your targeting, with your segmenting the market? Um, so that's the race and the culture. And then, of course, with your uh, targeting and segmenting, you also have the behavioral segmentation based on needs and benefits. What is some of the newest high-class drinks coming into Korea? 
Coffee has been around for over 20 years, a long time. Starbucks is relatively new, but coffee has been around for a while. Some people realize that wine is newer, and the high class people are generally starting to try to like wine. If that is a new trend, and you think that's a big international trend, it will grow, it will continue, then you should be thinking about, hmm, maybe I don't want just a Kenyong regular coffee shop. Maybe I want a coffee and wine shop. You can have wine sold in the evenings and coffee maybe more in the daytime, if that's your market. It's good to specialize in something, but think, what are the associations, your behavioral needs? Is there something that could be better than just wine to associate with coffee? Earlier, we said we want the high class business customer, not the top 1%, the richest people that want the cat poof coffee, but we want high class customers. You started saying you wanted the gentleman's club or a ladies' club. Is a wine shop closely connected with a gentleman's club? Or is that more of a whiskey scotch idea? The idea of scotch, single malt scotch, is becoming an increasingly popular thing. It's usually just for the high class. If you start serving high class single malt scotch and coffee together, that might be a huge impact on your image, your association. But of course, with that, you have to consider other things. Your influencers, for example. Even though you want to be associated with Scotch, there are legal influencers. And the laws might say you can't have the alcohol in the coffee shop business. It must be branded completely separately. Um, of course, this is related to the customer. And the customers, there are uh, innovators and the initiators. You need to find who is the best customer to target. Find that first best customer that will make getting the rest of the customers very easy. In general, who is that innovator? Who is everybody following? How can you find that with students? It should be easy to review blogs. Who's the most active in blogs? How can you find the innovators if you're looking at successful business people? If you're selling coffee to successful business people, that's question number two. Who is that innovator? How are you going to find that business person innovator and get him to start promoting your coffee? Because many people follow him. So that's question number two. Of course, there's the uh, behavioral segmentation, behavioral variables. You have to think, what are the occasions? What are the benefits? What are the user status? What's the user rate? What's the buyer readiness, the loyalty, attitude? The whole idea of, do you sell to just one individual customer? Or do you sell coffee to Korean airlines and have the airlines sell to wealthy customers around the world? What is your strategy? Are you focused just on domestically in Korea? Then maybe you don't care too much about inside the airplane, but you could still identify upper class business people go to the airports a lot. Maybe you want to do a lot of advertising in the airport. The airport's one of the best places to find upper level customers for luxury products or high-end products. So how can you get their loyalty? What was somebody going through the airport going to think of for loyalty. Segmenting the business markets, of course, the same thing. You're looking at the demographics, the operating variables, purchasing approaches, situational factors, personal characteristics. Of course, if you're selling to a business like an airline, they're going to purchase significantly differently than just selling to one individual person. Those things have to be considered. So the steps, one of the final things to talk about Steps in the segmentation process. We need to look at what's the need-based segmentation. Students have a certain need. That business, upper class business person, they have certain needs. How can you identify that segment? You want many young people. How do you identify that? You can identify it with students. But is it just the middle school students, the high school students? There's a variety of ways. 
Of course, there's the profitability segment. Uh, positioning is a huge thing. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to take a look at what is positioning. And I'm actually going to promote something from a different professor, Lars Berkovist. He is a, uh, uh, a very well-known international marketer, uh, an academic from uh, Sweden, and he's been specializing in East Asia and uh, not only working in Korea for a while, but uh, now he's working in China. He helped to develop this. This is basically from him. So we need to understand with his view of positioning, we need to go back. What is the marketing mix, the four Ps? What is positioning and what are suggestions for this? This is what he talks about. We all know the marketing mix is this four Ps, price, product, place, promotion. So what is positioning? It's the, according to Kotler, a famous uh, marketing expert, positioning is the act of designing the company's offer and image so that it occupies a distinct and valued place in the customer's mind, in the target customer's mind. So that maybe they don't think about it all the time, but it's there and it can be uh, ignited or influenced or become active when you show them that logo or when you show them that kimchi smell or when you show them that kimchi word or if they hear that, when your most impactful marketing, your kimchi marketing impact factor, that will associate with your positioning to make your customer's mind think about you. So the positioning brand answers these questions. What is it? Who is it for? What does it offer? So with, with coffee, for example, we have the positioning that could be a brand talking about a category need or the customer or the benefits. Again, what is it with the brand? How does the brand relate to the category need? And how does the category need relate to the brand? There must be based on customer perceptions of what's the type of product? What kind of product is the coffee? Is the student's idea the same as the upper level business person? Do they care about the kind of product in the same way? Possibly not. So with your positioning, you must think, uh, what is the customer, not your perception, but what is the customer's perception of the type of product? Next, the end benefit. Why do you drink coffee? Not just you as the marketer, but the customer. Why does the customer drink the coffee? Are they drinking it just to say, hi, I'm a rich person. I have brand name something in front of me, in front of me. Or do they just want that special taste associated with that business? Usage situation. When do you drink the coffee? When do you drink coffee? The fact that I have coffee today might be because I'm on video talking about coffee. Usually, I would drink a very different type of coffee. I have a very different usage situation. I think I talked to you guys. Some of you might be aware of that. I usually prefer coffee <laughs> if it has the Baileys or the Jameson Irish whiskey in it. So usually late at night when I'm entertaining with other people and it's an alcoholic beverage. Completely different than what the student's usage situation is. So the brand name. To me, brand name, Irish coffee, Spanish coffee. Those are brand names that I love, but it's not associated with a company, per se. It's associated more with a, a brand of alcohol more than the coffee. So what are the differences among the various brands of coffee? Anybody know, first of all, what is an Irish coffee? No? Uh, maple syrup is a, a, a syrup, but Irish coffee is, is not a syrup, no? My family uses coffee and maple, uh, not whiskey, brandy and syrup. Yes. Irish coffee is coffee. It could be any coffee. Doesn't matter the brand, doesn't matter the style of the coffee, but you take Irish whiskey and you put it in. And then you have Irish alcohol cream, something like chocolate milk, alcohol chocolate milk, like Irish Bailey's cream, and you put that in with usually whipped cream. That is an Irish coffee. It has nothing to do with Starbucks, nothing to do with Kopinguru Naru. It's related more to the alcohol. And I don't usually care about the brand of the alcohol, just that taste with the alcohol. So uh, make sure you understand there's many aspects that can come into it. Yeah, I 
The more, the better. <laughs> yes. Yes. Alcohol, usually there's one shot of, of uh, half a shot of a whiskey and maybe half a shot of this Irish cream in uh, the coffee. Yes. And so it's more for that aspect. That's why you will drink it than just the coffee. So we look at the type of product. Do you realize what is the type of product? Your view of coffee as a student is completely different than my view of the same thing. You say coffee, you think one thing. You have, your brain has a position for one image. Maybe it's just energy. Maybe it's just a black drink to study with. I don't think of those studying or the energy very much at all. I'm thinking of entertaining. I'm thinking of relaxing with other good people. So I would have a different type of product completely. Those are extremes. Otherwise, you also have your alcoholic drink versus non-alcoholic. Most people choose the non-alcoholic. Maybe I'm strange. Then you can have the hot coffee versus the cold coffee. Then you can have uh, types of products also. You get a milk, juice, water, soft drinks. Or hot could be coffee, tea, hot chocolate. Even then, you can change this and further segment it down. We're focused on what is segmenting. And you can segment it down. Are you focused on fresh ground coffee? Or could it be the powdered, soluble coffee? Or is it the caffeine coffee or the decaffeinated? Only then you will start looking at brand A, B, or C. Whether it's the Kopin Gurunaru, or to some place, or the high class Pol uh, Posot in Korea for the baristas. Or we could have the end benefit. We're looking at the types of positioning. You can position based on the type of product that we just discussed. And you can still, it's a lot more complicated than that. You can also position based on the end benefit. You must be thinking about all of these things. Marketing is not just a simple idea of, I think this is a good picture, make it pink. I think this is a good idea, make it expensive. You have to go into a lot more detail. So we can look at the type of product, as we said, or the end benefit. It seems similar, but how we get there is different. Is it a refreshment? Is it a stimulation? Is it a relaxation thing? And then if you are looking separately, is it, how does it compare to tea or alcohol or carbonated drinks? Or how does it compare to the soluble versus the ground? So there's many ways to segment and position your product. Then again, you can also classify it with the usage situation. So we have at least three ways here. Usage situation, end benefit, or the type of product. And as we said here, there's many. Type, end, usage, or then the brand name. Usage, as you see here, it could be used just for breakfast. Or the coffee could be used for a break. Or it could be used for meals. I got this just because I had a meal with another professor, and they actually gave it to me. Or is it just for the evening or the entertainment? Normally, the coffee I have is for the entertainment at the end. And then you can still break it down into these. And this is the most popular type. Professor Lars Berkovist is a famous professor. He's now at uh, uh, University of uh, some UK university in China, the Mingo branch. He's setting that one up. But he's more academic focused. He's looking more at the idea of coffee for breaks or evenings versus I might be looking more at the coffee with the Spanish coffee, very different. Even though we're studying the same thing, we're same, the same general age and the same general focus on academics and, and consulting, he has a different positioning than I do. So who is it for is important to consider. How does the brand influence the customer? How does the customer influence the brand? Can the customer influence the brand? Or does it, how, does it go the other way around? It does have an impact. For example, the brand, you could have this idea of this Starbucks coffee cup. If you have a paper cup with many students running around showing off they have this, that customer can influence the brand. 
The idea of rich students showing off a rich type of product will help associate with your brand, but maybe that might scare away your older business customers. How can you work together? Do you want to have no more paper cups? Some people say you have to worry about social marketing and the benefit to the community. Some people say these are actually very bad. And any company that has these are bad companies. Why? Why could this be considered a bad company? Why is this positioned in a negative way? Just the paper cup. Forget the logo, forget the brand, just paper cups. Deforestation. Deforestation. You should have your own homemade cup. You should have your long-term cup that you can just come in and fill it up. Those type of things are better for the environment. So some people will not like this if it's associated with students. Some people will not like this because it's not good for the environment. And of course, styrofoam cups are even worse. So there's a variety of things to look at uh, with this. So who is it for? The consumer market segmentation basis. We have the behavioral uh, factors. User status, user rate, usage occasion, the brand loyalty, benefits sought. What are they looking for? Or we can have the demographic aspect of positioning. What's the image, income, age, sex, race, family, psychographic, the whole idea of values, opinions, attitudes, activities, and lifestyle. That whole aspect that we were talking about here. This psychology of the customer, sometimes the customers don't even know their own psychology. A lot of people, you ask them, what is your culture? And they will tell you an answer that is very hard to tell the difference with any other similar countries. Some people from Korea says, my culture is this. And somebody from New York might think, oh, you're Japanese. Or, oh, you're Chinese. And that might be very, very negative impact on a Korean customer. So that psychographic concern is a big thing to understand. There's a lot that goes into the marketing. Uh, and of course, the geographical. Are you living in a very, very hot area? Are you living in a very, very cold area? If it's a hot area, do they want more of the iced coffee that we haven't even talked about yet? Business to business market segmentation based. Of course, you might think about the nature of the good, the kind, where it's used, the type of buy, the buying conditions, purchase location, who buys it, the type of buyer, and of course, the demographic, the whole idea of the uh, the codes or the number of employees with the demographics, the sales volume. So what does it offer? What's the reason why customers like our brand better than the competitors? If you're going to start your own coffee business, like Kopin Gurunaru, how could you answer this? Why would people like you better than Starbucks? What is a possible answer? Is it OK to just say, we're the same? Everybody's shaking their head. No, it's definitely it's not OK to plan your business saying, we are the same as Starbucks. Why? Because if you're the same as Starbucks, customers are just going to go to Starbucks. What is a possible positioning? What is a, top, a possible brand? What type of segmenting and targeting do you need to do to answer the question? What are the reasons that the customers like your brand better than some other brand? What is a possible answer? Why would somebody go to Kopin Guru Naru and not go to Starbucks? It's cheaper. You have a location that there's no other Starbucks. Great. So it could be the cost. And we identified you could be cheaper. Do you want to go for the cheaperness? The cheaper might attract more students, but is that w why Starbucks is famous? Many people say Starbucks is popular 
not because of just the quality, but because it is consistently expensive. And that price association is what makes many people want it. They think it's the best only because of the price. Maybe your price needs to also be high. So again, how else could somebody think you're better than Starbucks? Yes? You could show you have higher quality. How can you do that? It would be great to show your higher quality than Starbucks. But that's a very hard thing to do. How could you show you are better quality? What does better quality maybe mean? It could mean price. It could mean taste. It could mean paper cup. It could mean association with scotch whiskey. It could be an association with no students. What is better quality is a big thing to think about. Any other comments? Um, to show blind test. A taste test? Yeah, taste test? You can try this compared to this. OK? You could do that and end up maybe in jail in Korea. Because in Korea, if you say the other company doesn't taste good, that is illegal with marketing. Seven Korea, years of jail. Yeah, I saw the national TV. Yeah. OK. And then they show, they, they, can, they compare to coffee without, any, without, without showing brand name. And then they gave, they gave customers to taste it. And then maybe most of, most of customers then say national coffee rather than Okay. You can ask which your is better, which your is worse. Yeah. Okay, as a marketing person, you can make the program. You can set up two different coffees, make them secret. You can ask people what is better. That's okay. But if anybody answers the question, if your staff says yours is better than the other customers, if your staff says, Starbucks tastes bad, your staff can get attacked. And because you manage your staff, somebody could attack you as the business because you employ and train your staff. You have to make sure that the customer says it's better than the other one. But then again, if your customer gets sued for your activity, that might be a dangerous association. Yes, there's a lot of opportunities to think about that. Any other ideas? Sure. Any idea how you can do that? North America service, get it yourself. <laughs> or there it is, or just here it is, next, here it is, next. What is service depends on where you are. Sometimes North America, you have just one person working with you. In Korea, you could have five people working with you. If you're buying something in a fancy high class department store, Maybe five different workers will be taking care of you at the same time. One person asking what type of coffee, the other person is making the coffee, uh, somebody else is sitting you down. There's a lot of things that go into marketing and service. What do you identify with service? Numbers of people or, or paper cup? Staff's attitude, big smile, or the staff that's wearing a tuxedo and is very high class. The attitude of friendliness or the attitude of being the best. What kind of service do you like better? Both? Or you like the people that are just um, friends of yours. You're going to a place that other friends are working and very close and friendly with you. Or, do you, or some people like the place, they're going to that coffee shop just because they like that waiter or they like that waitress. Maybe they're trying to date them. That's one aspect. There, there's many aspects of it. Marketing can be complicated. You have to bring all of this together. And of course, what does it offer? In what ways is the brand similar to the competitor's brands? We have point of parity, the idea of what things are similar. 
Or you can have points of difference. In what ways is the brand better than the competitor's brand, like we were talking before? In marketing words, that's called points of parity or points of difference. Points of parity, more examples. You can have category points of parity, necessary to be a product category member. It may change over time. Uh, it's often critical for brand extensions. And then you can have the competitive points of parity. Professor Lars Berkovitz had some very, very good information when he was talking about this, identifying how are you associated with being better or worse? How are you associated with being different? Points of difference. Are you strong? Are you favorable? Do you have a unique brand association? How could Kopin Guru Naru have a strong, favorable, unique brand association? If Starbucks is the queen of the sea, how can you rise? What could be a strong, favorable, unique brand association if you are targeting the upper level business people? Can you think of any ideas? <laughs> okay. okay uh, we're getting uh, funny here. Since they, the competitors, are talking about the fish of the sea, the queen of the sea, as a joke, we don't want to be the sea, we'll be the land. What is an uh, association with the land? A big hairy cow. <laughs> is a big hairy cow good in Korea? Maybe not. A lot of Korean people usually think of animals like cows as low quality or, um, or, or maybe dirty, which you don't want to associate with your company. But, but it's a, you could think of that, a big buffalo coffee. That's one idea. Anything else? Yes? OK. Sure. Beans popping out of the ground. What about the back to the whole idea of scotch? Single malt scotch. Does anybody have a negative idea of scotch? Scotch whiskey. If you think of scotch whiskey in Korea, I'm not thinking of you, your idea. I'm thinking of people around you, the people that you know. Is scotch whiskey considered dirty, ugly animal? Or is Scotch whiskey considered differently? Is Scotch whiskey considered strong, favorable, unique? Is there anybody that thinks Scotch single malt whiskey is not strong? It's not favorable. It's not unique with coffee. What about that idea? So you could have the only, the first, the best coffee shop with scotch. How you do it can be different. Maybe you don't want to sound like a simple coffee shop. But having that positioning, the words are not important. It's the kimchi effect. It's the smell. It's the look. It's the, the sound. How can you associate your high quality coffee with the high quality single malt scotch whiskey. Yes, ideas? Uh, I think drinking the alcohol is limited to time because most people may drink alcohol at night. So if we choose drink, if we choose alcohol in this case with coffee, we have to extend our working time? You could. Is that a bad thing? When do coffee, so what we were talking about is we're considering we have coffee. How are we going to target? We're going to target upper class business people and upper class students. But students, we have to be careful. We don't want it to be young. We don't want them to be poor. So it's going to be expensive. And to be expensive, we're focused mostly on the upper class business people, guys or girls. Both could be OK. But we're thinking, how can we be unique? What is a point of difference with Starbucks? 
and we're looking at strong, favorable, unique brand associations. Scotch whiskey connection to my business could be one idea. Or high quality wine. In Korea, we have to be careful because there's many low quality wines. Scotch single malt whiskey, there's almost no low quality. Anything that's usually single malt scotch, at least in Korea, is considered good. Usually very expensive, very good. So if you could get that and associate it, you could have a strong, favorable, unique brand association. But a problem is true. Maybe people will think if it's just a whiskey place, that's only late at night. It's, it's lunchtime now. I want a coffee now. I can't go there because it's a whiskey place. Maybe the whiskey place is only at nighttime. Maybe they're not open and selling now. So yes, you must think about those things. Of course, um, it could be based on performance attributes, performance benefits, imagery associations. It could also be based on overall superior quality, which is a very good thing to be based on. You could be the low cost provider, but that's incredibly dangerous. When you start talking about working with students, having the lowest cost, that is very dangerous because somebody could always give away products if they're going out of business and hurt your business financially. You could always find somebody that might have a lower cost. So overall superior quality is almost always the best thing to pursue. Anything else is very dangerous. More things about points of difference, PODs. Uh, points of difference that are desirable and deliverable. Just the idea. Can you have a coffee shop that's associated with single malt scotch in Korea? Is it too expensive? Some people say no, because single malt scotch is too expensive. Some people think one bottle, more than $100. That's too expensive. I want expensive coffee, but not that much. However, you might be thinking about the whole idea of Guinness, Guinness beer. Guinness beer is considered the best in the world by many people. Single scotch whiskey is considered some of the best in the world. But if you go to those countries, they're regular drinks. And the prices are actually very low. I just got back from Nairobi, Kenya recently, and the price of Guinness is almost one of the lowest priced beers in the country. Most of the world thinks Guinness is the best, but the price in Kenya is very, very low. So what are the associations there? Is it de desirable? Is it deliverable? Can you actually do it? What is the relevance? What is the distinctiveness? Is it believable? If you're going to associate your coffee with the best quality in the world, will people believe you if you take out a small little, you know, <laughs> container, a stick of coffee, and open it and pour it in with hot water. Will people believe you have the best quality if that's what you're doing? Is it feasible to do it? Maybe the highest quality coffee has to be roast in front of you. And then when you roast it, then you have to grind it. And when you're pouring the coffee, the water has to be a special temperature and the water has to go around in a certain way. Is that feasible to have a big international coffee franchise? Maybe not, it takes too much time. So it's not sustainable that way. Bless you, bless you again. You must think of the competition. Target market partly defines the competitors. Of course, who is your competitor? Avoid narrow definitions of competition. Don't just think of coffee, versus my coffee, versus Starbucks coffee, versus to some place coffee. Bless you. You have to also think about the uh, product hierarchy, or competition occurs at other levels. Uh, for example, before we get into the problems with positioning, some coffee has competitors, which is air conditioning. Some people drink coffee, iced coffee, just to cool down in the summer, well, they'll have hot coffee to warm up in the winter. If you have a very hot environment, that might be a competitor. Of course, tea is a competitor as well. So problems of pos positioning. Companies sometimes try to build brand awareness before establishing a clear brand position. 
Make sure you know what is your position first, and then build your company accordingly. Um, companies often promote attributes that consumers don't care about. Both of those go into the basics of marketing. If you want to do good business, if you want to do good management, you must understand what is your strategy, and more important than your strategy, what is a strategy that customers appreciate? So be careful of the SRC. Companies sometimes invest too heavily in points of difference that cannot easily be copied. Sometimes you try to associate yourself with the single malt scotch whiskey, but I can't actually get enough of that in my coffee shop to be practical, so I can't actually do that. I can't copy that on a big scale. Certain companies sometimes are so happy responding to the competitors, the competition did this, I can do this. The competition did this, I can do this. Sometimes if you just respond like that, perhaps with Coca-Cola and Pepsi, or Burger King and McDonald's, that could make your image, your brand, your positioning in somebody's mind as always being number two. So make sure that you're not just responding to other people. Companies may think they can reposition a brand, but this is nearly always impossible, if not very difficult. If you start with a brand, realize it's super hard to change that idea. If you have a brand of just being so-so quality and so-so price, is it possible to change and now have a top quality brand? Maybe not. So if you're interested in more information, here's a bunch more reading. We're going to take a, a short break. We're at our class uh, midway break time. Um, after the break, we're going to be coming back. And I'd like to hear uh, at least two things from you guys. I asked you guys two questions related to the coffee franchise, how you can do the targeting, how you can do the segmenting, how you can brand a new coffee business. We'll start with that. After that, I would like you guys to start discussing your projects. How are you going to use the rest of this class? We only have one or two months left. How are you going to use the rest of the time to brand and market yourself using the class, using your group activities, using your research, using your surveying capabilities? OK, so let's take a five-minute break, and we'll come back and we'll continue. If you have any questions during the break, feel free to come talk to me.